hi, it's just us. It's just me here, and you're there listening. This time, I'm feeling quite determined. How about, let's figure it out. What is going on anyway? And yes, this is a what is the meaning of life sort of going on anyway. But why are we here? Do you ever wonder that? Doesn't everyone wonder that, especially when we're feeling busy and overburdened or particularly sorry for ourselves? A lot of times when I get my migraines, I wonder, what are we here for? What is the point of all of this if we're just going to get migraines? There certainly is a lot to keep up with as an adult and a home space keeper and an artist and a lover of wandering in the woods. And I'm somebody who loves and makes stickers. You know, there's always something to attend to about stickers, making them, curating them. Okay, that's pretty specific. I know not everybody is making stickers. I love my books. I'm sure my books could use a once over all that bookkeeping. I need to bring out my inner librarian and do a little bit of sorting and probably some sending on. But I'm not really talking about all the things there are to do. And hopefully, in the end, it just makes me and us feel more abundant and rich with certain joys of life to have all of these things to do. There is something about September that is around the to-do list, and it's, oh, I'm going right into it. The wisdom coming through is that it's so important to take that energy of the to-do list and make sure that that integrated self, the one that is here to express themselves in an integrated, grounded, centered way, that energy of that to-do list can propel us to make certain creative, innovative decisions, not like to change the world, but yes, like to change your world. Hmm. All this and more (laughs) on what is going on anyway. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Anne Headley, and this is my podcast, What is Going On Anyway, where I contemplate the current moon, where it is in its cycle, and what that means for me as a pathway through daily life. I wonder over universal themes and how they show up for us through these different moon cycles. And as I reach for meaning using my intuition and imagination and storytelling to share with you, I find I'm discovering a richness in the simplicity of paying attention to life as it is. So sometimes as I prepare for these podcasts, I like to go on YouTube and listen to every predictive astrologer I can handle which ends up being like maybe two or three. Um, Sometimes I do that. Sometimes I don't. I didn't have it in me. I didn't want to do that this time. I think I, I watched someone last time and the full moon, the prediction was so much intensity. And I was like, I don't want to say it, but I just felt like there was going to be major storms and some kind of calamity. And probably there was, it just didn't affect me directly. So then it kind of felt strange to me that there was a strong predictive feeling of uh, tumult. Is that a word? Tumult? And then, I don't know, that just felt weird to me. So I'm not doing that this time. I didn't listen to anybody. I'm just going with my feelings. And this. let's just take this little snippet of a moment. And the feeling feeling that I have about this new moon is that it feels very much like 
two channels, and they're not necessarily going in the same direction. So there's one channel, which is a little bit like what I said before, which has to do with the to-do list, not anything at all that's on your actual to-do list. If you could separate the to-do list from the energy of the to-do list, the actual tasks are one thing that motivate you to the other thing. And that's what I'm trying to reach for to talk to you about is that there's an underlying, it's like a gear turning under the to-do list. So we, well, I make a lot of to-do lists. I have many, too many to-do lists. Let's say you don't do like me and you just have one. So you write down your to-do list on a piece of paper and that holds the energetics of like a train going. The ideal of it is that you do one thing and you do another thing. And as you check the things off the list, you're creating a kind of momentum. So there's something so important about this new moon, which is setting the momentum in order that's going in the direction that you want it to go. And so like if we did this little exercise together, which we're totally not going to do, but imagine, (laughs) imagine if you wrote down a to-do list right now, (laughs) just imagine, (laughs) and then you press pause, you give yourself some time to write it down and write down a to-do list that doesn't include the things that you have to do for other people or that you have to do for some idea about yourself, but the to-do list that has to do with fulfilling your center-grounded purpose of being. And I know that is not a simple thing, but you know what I mean. It's like, drink a cup of water when I wake up. But it's not just that. It's also like, call the friend that you keep having dreams about, but you haven't talked to in six months. Return the books that are taking up a shelf of your office space that you are not going to read, but belong to other people. Those kinds of things. Ready? Go. And of course, it also includes things like make the appointment for that vet visit that you haven't done and, you know, do the things that need doing. It includes everything, but it holds the wholeness of you and or your family and or your very small community. It it holds all of you. Okay, now let's imagine that you have the list, or maybe you actually have the list. Now you're going to look at that list and then take a big deep breath in. Sigh it out. (sighs) Feel the way you are taking up space right now. And look at your list and just notice if any of those things have to do with you being something other than what you actually are and see if you can either change that way that you're expressing that like you might need to put some parameters around it like to do you know call this friend as long as I have that great expansive feeling about talking to them because you have to be centered and grounded when you go into this place. And so what I'm saying about this new moon is that we want to use this energy of diving into September and Virgo season in a really thoughtful way, as if we are masters of flow, And that we know if we do one thing and then the other, there's a momentum that builds and a great feeling that builds. And we actually get bigger in our own grounded stance. And so that we are 
content in that. And we're actually more effective at all the things we do so that there becomes an efficiency about the way we be. So that's the one aspect of this moon, the way I'm seeing it, predictively. And the flip side to that is using creativity to innovate in ways we never imagined. And I've got a story to go along with that. And I'll tell you that story. But I just want to add on to those two things that I see this new moon as and sort of moving in different directions, but commingling. There's like a sprinkling of this upsurge of internalized oppression or internalized authoritarian thinking. For me, it doesn't make sense. I am perfectly free to make decisions as I want to. But some stuff has come up for me around old patterns of how family works. And I can feel myself expressing a kind of paralysis that in st- the feeling is so intense in me of needing to do it right according to some external authority, do family life, do raising my boys in a certain way, doing it right according to someone else, not me, that I go into this kind of paralysis of indecision. It's so hard and painful emotionally to know myself as such a frady cat. <laughs> and the I would give you specifics. This is not a specifics kind of thing. It's just feelings that that kind of bubbled to the surface. And then I could feel myself um, experiencing it and wanting to run away from it, but not running away and sort of just being in the state of not going to, do one thing or another. I know that's really vague, but that's that's as close as I'm going to get to it. I'm just wondering if maybe it's not just me. Like sometimes I have these stories going on. I share them with you. It doesn't mean that this is a theme that's going on for everyone. But I can guess, like when I hear a story, I also relate to it in my own way and notice how that might be also happening for me. So maybe there's something, you know, there's this feeling going on inside me. Maybe it resonates somewhere with you. And maybe it is a universal theme. I don't know. It makes sense that every once in a while, these internalized oppressions, this internalized authoritarian regime on the inside that says you have to do it this way. There are no other options. You can't be creatively minded around this. It's this way and not that way. That feels so hard and mm, deep. Like I have a really deep sense of right and wrong and good and bad inside of me. Some people might say, oh, that's, you know, we need to have a moral code. But I want to have a way of critically looking at problem solving inside. And so when I know I have this inner authoritarian that isn't willing to look at all sides of an issue, that's something for me. I have to break that down inside of me, or or I don't have to, but I would like to break that down inside of me so that I have the freedom inside of my own mind. This has nothing to do with anyone else. Inside of my own mind to have the freedom to expansively look at a situation. I don't mean to be vague and weirdly nonspecific. I hope that makes sense. But let's just look at the sprinkling of internalized oppression for all of us coming up as we 
get some momentum around a to-do list that has to do with diving into fall and winter and coming in the other direction, I see the to-do list as going away from us and this other direction is innovative creativity coming towards us and and it's like stitching into the to-do list, which means that to, the to-do list is a um, malleable mechanism. And that's why it's important for me, not what is written on that list, but what is the energy behind the to-do list. And it can't be for other people. I mean, it can be for other people, but the whole to-do list has to do with keeping your feet on the ground, keeping yourself so that you are, you know, not in that frenzy of catching up, whatever that means. So maybe this new moon is about both and all of these things, about giant leaps and how we make these leaps, all the little steps that it takes to build the strength to take a giant leap, and also about caretaking, the ways we've developed strategies to cope. And that's what I'm talking about. So some of my internalized oppression is developing strategies to cope in a world that didn't make sense to me growing up. And we might not want to continue utilizing those strategies because we have a lot of we have a lot more freedom than we, maybe we think we do. We can utilize more of our freedom. And therefore, we may not need to use some of these habitual strategies. I'm wondering about how we respect and honor the strategies that we've used too. I think that's important. So the story I want to tell you began several years ago and... Patina, my friend and neighbor, gave me this big roll of paper and it felt abundant and expansive. And I took this roll of paper and I tacked it up to my bedroom wall. And I looked at it for a, a week or so. And then I had an idea of something that I wanted to see how it would play out. And I drew it on the wall and it included a my face and these thought bubbles coming out from it and I wanted Peabody to be there and this was a huge I've never done a drawing so big so I had all this space and I wanted the barn to be there and I wanted the river and I was thinking about networks and pathways and roots and mycelial networks and I wanted all of it there. And it started off just as a graphite drawing. And I loved it. I was very satisfied with it. And I loved that it was private. It was in my room private. And then I wanted there to be color. So I moved this drawing down to the studio and it lived there for at least another year. And I started bringing color in with all kinds of medium, whatever I could get my hands on. There was some oil paint, some acrylic, there was some pastels and some extra graphite. And I brought color in, which was quite challenging because it's one thing to imagine it and then completely other thing to figure out. You know, I didn't have the skills that I really needed to do what I saw in my mind. And then I got to the point where I was, I don't know if I was completely satisfied, but I was done. I didn't want to work on it anymore. And it was sort of like, well, good enough, I guess. It was so big, it was hard for me to take it all in. And I didn't have the technical skills to take that size of a piece of paper and design it well enough so that you would have like one focal point. It was like a lot of stories going on. And then how did it work out? I think Jason suggested I start looking at it in three parts so that I could kind of understand 
it in sections that it was too much for me to take all at once. And somehow that turned into the idea of seeing it as a cylinder. And I took it off the wall and I kind of wrapped it around my body and I held it up and I just spun in a circle. That was inspiring to me, but I knew I couldn't I couldn't hang it that way. And my friend Krista does this art event called Aliyup, and it's through Artivism in Maine. And so she's got these four art happenings. And this one that's coming up is themed around mind. And I was like, oh, it could be in that show. This is about my mind. This is exactly about my thinking mind, this piece. And so just having a deadline seems important for me. And I was able to fabricate a, a cylinder with Jason's help. I couldn't do it alone. I could maybe, I don't know. I needed help. We fabricated, we fabricated. That's not a word. <laughs> I'm going to leave that in there. Oh, I have to just take a minute and decide, am I going to leave that in there or I'm going to edit it out? I just don't want to edit it out. Fabricated. So we fabricated a cylinder and Jackie next door, well, I was talking to her about it and she was like, I've got a motor for it because I was going to try and figure out how, how it, was I going to get it to spin. She went upstairs to her studio and she brought me down this motor, which I think is exactly the right speed. It's going in the direction that I wish it would go in the opposite direction. But besides that, it's perfect and it's good enough. And so we've got it hung and it's spinning. And I cannot tell you the level of satisfaction to see that come together. It's like when you make a beautiful cake, but it's it, like five times better than that. For me, does that, does that describe it? Very. It was deeply satisfying to get to this this point where the vision kept including more, and then coming to this place where it makes sense to me to see it in the shape of a cylinder, to see only a little bit of the painting at a time as it rotates in front of you. You can't take the whole thing in, and that is more pleasing to me as a piece. So what I'm describing to you here in this story is a creative process, right? And the creative process isn't about knowing what it's going to be from the beginning and doing it. That's a whole different thing. The creative process is allowing yourself to be in relationship and collaboration with an idea and letting that take you to a new place. So once this thing was hanging from the ceiling and spinning, I was like, I want to get inside it. And then once I was inside it, I thought it's just going to be silly to see little feet coming out of it. But then once I was inside it, I was like, or was it Jason? We were like, what happens if you light it up from the inside? That's interesting. So we lit it up from the inside. And then I got back inside and I held the flashlight of my phone on one side of my head. And then I had this silhouette coming from the inside of this piece. And it just got more and more layers of interesting and curious and fun. And so this whole story, <laughs> this whole long story is about the creative process cannot be about knowing exactly what you're going to end up with. And I think that's the important part of the second channel of this new moon is being in relationship with your creativity, even if it doesn't have anything to do with like... Um, to three-dimensional art. There's a way that we are able to exist in our brain, which is receptive and open and collaborative. And to me, that's a kind of creativity or that is creativity. And I think it's like that's a, an underutilized function of our being. 
And I just have this incredible, is it a fantasy, imagination, hope, desire, that when we all access that and we've got ourselves feeling grounded and taking up the space that we occupy on the earth, that that has something to do with creating the kind of world that we would like to live in. So that story is around the second part of this new moon, which is let yourself be innovative with your creativity. There's something about creativity and play, and play is this fantastic way of learning. Play doesn't work. It, you know, I would say it doesn't work well, but I don't think it actually works at all unless there's a feeling of safety. So like if you're playing with someone and they're not safe, you might call it play, but it's definitely not play for them. So everyone involved has to feel safe for it to be play. And if it's play, that's where real learning is occurring. So there's something there, right? There's a to-do list. There's an energy of the to-do list. This, this feeling of wanting to be fully participating here. And then there's this other energy of innovative creativity coming through. There's no way to put that on the to-do list because the innovative creativity is coming in to change the top sheet of your to-do list, not to change the that engine underneath it, but some of the things on your to-do list are going to be, they'll shift. Like there may be some things that you, you do or that I do. I got to get specific here, right? It's got to be about me. So say there's something on my to-do list, which is um, contact this person that you promised you would do a reading for. This is not you, Mandy. This is someone else. (laughs) I really want to do yours that you promised you were going to do a reading for, but you know it's not going to work. And that might get crossed off your to-do list in order to make space for the thing that is more aligned with you in this moment. Okay. I get to this point and I'm like, I should go back and listen and see if this makes any sense at all. And then I think, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't know if it's because I'm actually too lazy to do that or if my intuition says that's not necessary, you're doing fine. And I wonder if even that, that sort of self-critical part of me that wants it to be perfect or as good as it can be, I wonder if that's something that I can let go of. And again, this comes back to what I'm thinking of before. How do we have respect and honor as we let go of some of the ways of being that we've become accustomed to? So I did this huge dump run this weekend. Jason and I took a trailer and filled it with stuff that has needed to go for a long time. We did this rug demo for our neighbor and the rug has been in the trailer for longer than I want to admit. But this was the weekend and we took it and recycling. And while we were there, we had this conversation with the dump manager. He's fascinating. So fascinating. I have dreams of doing a documentary film about him. I just love him to talk about what he knows about our community, not in like a gossipy way, but what he really knows about people by watching the way they get rid of their trash. I just think that's fascinating. We talked about how it's hard for people to let go of their stuff and their trash. And I sort of laughed because as he was talking, I thought he could do this add-on service where he offers people (laughs) these um, 
little funeral services, mini funeral services that he could give to them and to help them let go of their stuff. And then I sort of started rolling over in my head thinking like, imagine if our spiritual practices included our acts of recycling, our acts of dealing with trash. I mean, it just seems like it closes that cycle, right? One of the things that he did tell us that drove him crazy, he said, people put things that are useless out for free on the side of the road and they throw away the good stuff. And I just thought, oh, I don't know. I was thinking of that quite symbolically. So respect and honor for how we let go of things, how we have been habituated to let go of things, and how we might start letting go of things in the future. Some of the things may not be for us right now, but maybe for our neighbors. We picked up this like cast iron bench that needed some replacement slats. I'm really excited about that. That wasn't trash. That was total treasure. So healing around letting go. Maybe some discernment about what it is that we think we need to let go of versus what actually isn't doing us any good. And really, you know, like what the dump manager said, people are confused about what they think still has another life and what they think they need to let go of. A while ago, I took this online class with Mirabai Star called Acknowledging Our Grief. And she gave us this writing prompt. She wanted us to start with what breaks my heart. And I want to read to you what I wrote. Because I think acknowledging our grief is important and this is pretty simple. Babies and kittens crying, needing, and nothing is there for them. That breaks my heart. When there's no warm, soft belly for them to nuzzle. My heart breaks in helplessness. Those are the times my tears flow, when I see too much, no more than I'm ready to know. I'm still very much the child in love with the world. When the neighborhood boys threw a frog at an oak tree and laughed at its death, my heart broke, and I was so scared. If they could do that to a frog, what of me? I was so much smaller than them, so I pedaled my bike in a big circle to move away from them, but not too far because I needed to know where they were. They didn't even know this, but I was trapped in their sphere, terrified, but observant, watching them more carefully. I forgot to attend to my play. It became the play that I didn't write, always being surprised by what the boys in the neighborhood would do to scare me. Well, that's what I wrote. Now, of course, they weren't doing that to scare me, but it did scare me. And by being more concerned about the terrifying things around me, I wasn't able to attend to what was important, which was my own play. And I'm sort of pointing that out here with this new moon, this to-do list, is getting back to the heart of what is our play, not what we're terrified of and we have to be hypervigilant about, but what is our authentic, deeply true play and how can we create our to-do list around getting back there and letting that collaborate with creativity. She gave us another prompt after this, which is, I dare to believe was it just I dare to believe or I dare to believe that it's true? I don't remember, but I'm going to read this to you too. I dare to believe that it's true. We are walking through the end of times together. And I dare to believe I will be alive to witness the beginning of a thousand years of peace. I dare to believe that life is more than just the living and that those who've died have a say 
in the ongoing story of things. I believe they still have influence and desire for shifting trajectories of connections and revelations between living beings on the earth. But you know, more specifically, I dare to believe that my life matters and that I have something inside of me that wants to see the light of this world and have some teeth. Some of the things have only ever lived on the inside of me. And of course, in the next breath, I wonder if it doesn't matter at all. Having something live in this complex, unique configuration of me, that's also a small miracle. I spent last weekend at the Matriarch's Gathering, where we had a theme of grief and joy. There was lots of crying, and lots of healing, and lots of connection. And even there, I could feel myself wanting desperately to shift some of the ways of being that have become habituated to me. The, the feeling of where am I going to, that middle school feeling of where am I going to sit? Who will my friends be? In a place that was so welcoming and so accepting and loving and kind and generous, I still had a lot of those old feelings bubbling up to the surface. And I needed to do something with that kind of social anxiety. It wasn't just me. There, I had many conversations where going into a space where you don't know many of the people, but it's a, a large group, it brings up these uh, feelings and sometimes old memories. So there was a lot of letting go, not just of that, but that was just a very sort of surfacey thing happening there. I was a little bit confronted with my own pokey patterns of oversharing and, and oversharing, over caring. It's not even over caring. What was I doing? I was speaking. I was speaking in a way and giving advice when nobody asked me. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. Oh, anyway, over the weekend, because I got to have a lot of interactions with people I don't know, I could really see how I, when confronted with a little bit of anxiety and really wanting approval and validation, how I overstep my boundaries and I get in other people's space and I don't mean to, I don't want to. And then if somebody pushes back and was like, hey, you're a little too close to me, but not like physically too close, but like you're too mentally, emotionally too close, you're in my space, then I would get this feeling of rejection. It happened once and I, oh, Oh, I don't even want to talk about it now. Blech. But what I did was completely different because in the past, I would have found this person, gone back over to them and said, I'm so sorry, please forgive me, I can do better. And instead of doing that, I just gave them space. They said back off, you know, in one way or another, and I just backed off. I just backed off and took care of my own feelings. And then it took about three hours. <laughs> it took three hours. And then I felt good. And I was like, oh, that was so kind to myself to simply back off, come back into my own cozy self and stay. So I learned a lot. Okay. Let's see what the I Ching has for us this new moon. We get hexagram 18, corruption. As soon as I read that, I was like, I don't want this one. Let's do it again. But I kind of have this thing where I don't do that. I'm not here to pick and choose the hexagrams we get. So hexagram 18, corruption. At least I could find some other names for it. Let's see. Repair. That's, that's nice. 
corruption and pestilence renovating. So that's interesting to think about how those words go together. So corruption, repair, renovating. The key questions, what is behind this trouble? What is the hidden cause? In ancient China, ancestors angered by neglect would send sickness and misfortune. This corruption, something dark like a curse lurking under the surface of life and manifesting as patterns of negative experience. We don't have to believe in angry ancestors to be haunted by corruption, whether we inherit its darkness from our past, our culture, or through our parents. When you receive hexagram 18, it's time to examine those old, old patterns at last, to seek out their source and give it due honor and attention. When you understand where your experience comes from, you can restore the creative flow and make a genuinely new beginning. You will need to commit yourself to the journey and take the risk of crossing the great river into unknown territory. And you will need to pay careful attention to the process. Before seed day, which marks the beginning of a new cycle of time, you'll need to identify the source of the corruption and prepare for change. Afterwards, you need to pay attention to the needs of the new growth. Each of these phases has only a modest duration you're invited to attend and examine, but not to dwell on this change for a lifetime. We get changing line two. I don't always read the changing lines, but I want to this time. It says, ancestral mother's corruption does not allow constancy. The mother is profoundly committed to provide nourishment and space for her family to grow. The ancestral mother's corruption means that this provision and commitment isn't working. It's not possible to carry this situation through to the desired outcome. You know, I see that as like, it seems as though our current system of our, hmm, I'm always trying to look for ways to say it in a gentler way, but the way capitalism is working for us, and it's, I don't think it's capitalism. The way the corporate oligarchy, is that better, is working for all of us, that's what I'm seeing as kind of ancestral mother's corruption, that the promise was it was going to provide for everyone, but it doesn't seem to be working. The promise was. Was it a promise? It was... uh, I just don't want to go into that too much. But the ideal was, you know, everybody could have a piece of this somehow, some more than others. Or maybe that wasn't the idea at all. But anyway, it's not working, right? It's not working. Corporate, corporations not taking responsibility for the current, the way things are. Let's just say not taking responsibility for the climate crisis and thinking that individuals recycling will do it. Oh, anyway, I don't need to go into that, right? Let's just read this. The ancestral mother's corruption means that this provision and commitment isn't working. It's not possible to carry this situation through to the desired outcome. What's started is not sustainable. Things cannot come to full growth. Perhaps a lack of resources means there's not enough available to give. Perhaps the reality of the situation simply makes your vision unfeasible, and mother's corruption lies in not letting go. In any case, you cannot bring about the resolution you want by just forging on. Instead, you need to develop personal boundaries, neither too rigid nor too porous, that allow you to respond without reacting. You need to recapture some independence of soul. I'm not saying that the corruption of the mother is the corporate oligarchy. But there's something about corruption of the mother. There's something like, you know in Sophie Strand's book, The Madonna Secret, and one of the themes there is that Mary Magdalene could see that she wasn't 
standing up for her right to be equal to Jesus, even though she knew it inside of herself and that she sort of dismissed her power in certain ways. That might be the corruption of the ancestral mother and that now we're here, and I'm not talking about gender right now, but we're here to stand and take up our full space in every way that that means. And by doing that, we're resetting and really, like the I Ching says, recapturing independence of soul. Love it. It moves to hexagram 52 stilling, which is the mountain or mountain over mountain. Beautiful. Questions for you. What if there were nothing you had to do now? What if there were nothing you had to do now? What if there were nowhere else you had to be? Where is your inner point of balance? To still yourself is to come to rest in your own right place. It is not the opposite of motion, but of being pushed into motion by outside influences. Whether you move or stop is determined inwardly by your sense of the nature of the time. Attaining this kind of stillness means firmly, even stubbornly, resisting the forces that would disrupt your equilibrium. Hold yourself still, as if in meditation. Don't seek to grasp yourself by hunting down your every thought. You can no more make them stop by force of will than you can make your back still by holding it with your hands. Instead of twisting and spinning in circles trying to grasp yourself, keep still. In the same way, you can move freely in your rooms or the chambers of your mind, which can be just as crowded, and simply not see the other people there because you hold yourself still and do not resonate with them. I need to read that again, don't I? In the same way, you can move freely in your rooms or the chambers of your mind, which can be just as crowded, and simply not see the other people there because you hold yourself still and do not resonate with them. It's kind of like being invisible. Even if you feel as if you ought to be constant, constantly sensitive to their presence and needs, in a time of stilling, it is no mistake to exclude all these things and be quiet within yourself. Oh, that reminds me of that interaction I had at the matriarchs gathering where someone gave me a back off lady in the nicest possible way. I just took it badly. And rather than me going back with this kind of insecure need for validation and approval from that, what I was taking as a rejection, I just stilled myself and stilled myself, completely new for me. And so what if this also is a time of stilling? That it's not just that all of a sudden I had this magical capability of not following those old patterns of being, but maybe this is a time of stilling. Maybe this is here for all of us, this opportunity. Now look, I pulled some angel cards. We got clarity, grace, and detachment. Yes. And I got this deck called Woodland Wardens. It's a 52-card oracle deck and guidebook by Jessica Rue. And I just got it because it was purdy. And I pulled this one for us. It's card two, the spider and passion flower, creative ingenuity. How about that? Spiders represent a balance of light and dark, cunning yet patient. They spin intricate webs that are both beautiful and deadly. The passion flower is a vining flower that has come to symbolize faith. It was named by 16th century Jesuit missionaries who associated the plant with the passion of Christ. Its filaments represented the crown of thorns, its ten petals, the ten faithful apostles, and so on. You can solve your problems unconventionally and with cleverness. 
You need only exercise patience in order to fully appreciate the results of your labor. Now, this card, because it's a spider in a web, also reminded me of another conversation I had at the matriarchs gathering. And this woman had a conversation with me and she said that she overheard this or she was in another conversation where someone said, the times that we are in now are about the conversation between the spider and the mouse. And we were just taking that sort of as a a puzzle or a riddle. And it occurred to me that the spider is in the web and so that the spider is the being that is fully connected, having a conversation with the mouse who is the small individual feet on the ground, but the small individual that may not feel the connection to the web of life. And so the conversation between the spider and the mouse could be a wonderful collaboration, but it also could be something that needs to be bridged that how do we have the conversation with the being who feels always in the web of life so the spider always knows what's going on always connected and the mouse who feels very small and individual and possibly i don't want to speak for mice but i'm just seeing it as if the mouse is the small individual self that doesn't necessarily feel connected and that conversation seems vital right now how do we find our connection our relationship with the one who feels everything through the web of life okay you guys i think we're full i think that's saturation point i've gone on longer than i usually do go on do you know how much i appreciate you being here and actually The fact that you've listened all the way to the very tippy top of the end. Thank you so much for holding space for me and these ideas. And I'll be back next time, full harvest moon. We're moving into eclipse season, which sounds ominous, doesn't it? I don't know. Maybe there'll be big changes and maybe there won't, but... Inside all of that, we are developing networks and collaborations and creating some kind of world. This is what I hope, right? We're creating some kind of world that we want to participate in. And I can see that happening in my own life, even making that art piece and talking to people about it and having food with my neighbors and Uh, That's the kind of world I want to live in. So let's do more of that. And also reach out to me and tell me the kind of world you want to live in. And let me talk about it next time. Some of your ideas, they're important. Oh, and I need to mention Medusa because that's another creative idea. And I want to talk to Holly about that. And hopefully you're listening. And okay, so that's for next time. Next time. Next time, or I'm not going to make any promises, but I have some ideas about the myth of Medusa that I want to share with you. Okay. You can always reach out to me through my website, www.annheadley.com or on Patreon, which is patreon.com slash watermoonstudios. Until next time, may you be well, may you know peace. May all beings everywhere, whether known to me or unknown, be well, and may they know peace. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.